Hi, everyone. I'm your host, Chris Sands, and today we have a very special episode and a special guest co-host joining, sitting in the co-host chair for I don't know how many times now, but he's back in it. Keith, this is only the third time? Yeah. Oh, cool. Well, I'm glad you found because I didn't. Um, Keith (laughs) Marku, one of the (laughs) co-founders of Old Mother Brewing Company, and then our special guest, Colin Gurner from, uh, is it Gurner or Jerner? I didn't know. Gurner, you nailed it. Some people go Jerner, yeah, you nailed I it. I should have just kept Bro, going. Great yeah. start. <laughs> he is the president and co-founder of Stash Strong. Um, and w- that's one of the reasons why Keith is joining us, not just because we absolutely love him, um, but he is one of the breweries that is participating in the Stash Strong beer, beer this year. So thank you for joining me, gentlemen. Glad to be here. And as you can guess, um, out of the three of us, Colin has by far the most majestic mustache. So, absolutely, just getting going. <laughs> so, I, I mean, I watched um, I watched the documentary um, earlier, which I could say it, it brought me close to tears, if not maybe a, a little once. Um, you had epic mustaches during that. Full on, full yeah. on curl. So I, I, I've never, I've never gone to that because every time my mustache gets to the point where I feel like I get there, maybe I just don't know what I'm doing, but like I feel like it just gets the way of everything whenever it's that long. It, you got to start cutting underneath and let it grow up high, but it's an art. I've definitely learned over the past three years of uh, getting to the. Maybe that's a, blessed my problem. Space. Is I need to do some research on how to do it properly because I just get annoyed and then like go up to my bathroom and rip out the yeah. rip it off yeah the it the last couple of weeks have grown <laughs> yeah i certainly lack the patience for that as well and this uh one of my one of my sides doesn't curl it just goes straight no matter what i do wax doesn't matter so that makes me no want version. you to do it even more now yeah. <laughs> i'll do it i'll do it i don't care yeah my, my well, mustache grows like twice as fast as my beard and i just had to trim my beard because i pick i pick and uh daddy put a little hole right there so I, um, I, can, I can get the stash going. I'll get the stash going. I may consider, I, I, I don't know. I, I'm not sure how my wife would respond to me just having a mustache. Um, <laughs> going you, just you mustache. Have a nice beard. You have a nice beard, though. But like, uh, masks are maddening with beards. So uh, like, well, thanks. We're, we're on the cusp of uh, them not, you know, we're on oh. their way out. Uh, I I think we're still a while, a while before we'll be left. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I, we're we're off topic way too early. Um, right, this is what right. happened. <laughs> this is what happens when I allow Keith to be involved with anything. So I apologize right now, Colin. <laughs> um, <laughs> why don't we start out with you telling you know what? us what Stash Strong is? Yeah. I think I mean that's why we're here to get the word out about Stash Strong. Absolutely. Stat Strong is a uh, 501c3 nonprofit organization that uh, my brother and I started uh, after his unfortunate diagnosis of glioblastoma, uh, known as GBM to many, uh, in September of 2017. So he uh, was diagnosed right before his 28th birthday. And kind of, you know, this is a disease that has a 10 to 15 month uh, life expectancy, you know, 5% of those diagnosed last five years, uh, all stats that are tough to hear and, and even tougher when you realize that there's not a lot going on to change those statistics. So, you know, as if fighting an incurable disease wasn't enough, uh, we decided to start Stat Strong uh, to raise awareness and funds for brain cancer research in March of 18. So we just had our uh, three-year anniversary nine days ago um, as of recording. And, you know, a lot has happened uh, since finding it. My, my brother unfortunately passed about 14 months ago um, in classic GJ fashion, doubling what doctors and experts, you know, said was his uh, expected life uh, time frame after GBM. But, you know, I continue our, his fight and it's, it's now my fight and our family's fight uh, to continue to raise awareness and funds for brain cancer research. You know, when you first find out about this disease, you naturally are, are scared and oftentimes kind of hide in the corner and we want to bring everyone out and, and kind of, you know, in a way that Jujin did by fighting every day with a smile on his face and a tenacity that 
you know, can't even be properly described uh, with words, but you know, we, we've raised almost half a million dollars um, to date, have launched four clinical trials and continue to kind of serve as a beacon of hope for families across the country that have been diagnosed. And, you know, as we've continued to grow and, and do more, we've really expanded our events into a you know national landscape uh, to ultimately raise even more awareness and funds for this underrepresented area. Is it, is it a rare form of cancer? It is. And it's funny, the rare, the rare word uh, gets thrown out a lot. And, you know, I, 15,000 people die annually from this disease. And I think if we, it's, if not, you were to think about, rare. it's not rare, but the, yeah. the word, the connotation of rare is often the first thing that people say a rare you know, cancer. It's okay. the primary uh, tumor in, in, uh, in uh, adult brain cancer. Um, but, you know, it doesn't have hundreds of thousands of people diagnosed annually, which makes it in that realm. But I know way too many people and I've gotten way too close to too many families to use the word rare uh, anymore. But yes, it is oftentimes with that connotation. Yeah. I yeah. thought I had seen somewhere it listed as rare, but I mean that, I guess if you put it in context compared to other forms of cancer and their unfortunate high rates of Americans getting them. It's rare from that aspect. So has that hurt it? Like the research in it by like having before your help and awareness, like not a lot of, was not a lot of money spent on research. Yeah, there's definitely less. And I think a lot more is happening and not just, you know, because that's strong, but there's definitely been um, higher public image individuals who have been diagnosed and unfortunately passed. And I think that naturally, changes the conversation uh, and gets more eyes on it. But again, you know, you look at something like I always compare it to um, you know, colon cancer, right? Five, 10 years ago, it, it, it was a death sentence and not that it isn't, but you know, if I were to say 95% of people diagnosed with GBM will not see their life in five years, I think we would do things a lot quicker <laughs> and yeah. it's a tough cancer and it's, it is the leading brain tumor uh, in terms of cancer. So it's noticed it's, it's being, it, it's difficult because it, it's in the brain and there's plenty of scientific uh, things I won't even dive into that I've learned way too much about. But because of that, I think it's both difficult and, you know, in the past underrepresented, but we're kind of trying to change that one day at a time. Yeah. I, I mean, you're way more in the world than I ever got into of like, medical research when my my wife's father passed away from leukemia a long time ago so she's been always been involved in raising money for the leukemia and lymphoma foundation yeah. so we like we'll go to those um <clears throat> fundraising dinners and things like that and like i'll watch the videos and like that was tough <laughs> the well the, like from yeah from an emotional standpoint stuff but like from when they start talking about treatments and like research breakthroughs and like you're just kind of amazed at how much smarter people are out there <laughs> like i, I mean you know, I feel yeah, like yeah. i'm just a moron come like watching them talk about what they've just discovered yeah i mean I, i'm a cpa and you know this is my not even my i call my uh full-time night job <laughs> but you know so i obviously never studied medicine or science or the anatomy of the brain and you know, I know a lot from a layman's terms and uh, entry level more than obviously your average human just from being so deep in this world. But it is fascinating because the brain is such a difficult and exquisite organ, right? Um, that things are happening and it's tough. But what ha needs to happen is more research, more awareness, more talking about it like what we're doing today, where both, I think science is a huge piece of what we do, right? Because ultimately our mission is to fund brain cancer research. The secondary kind of pillar of our organization as like a beacon of hope uh, wasn't what we started as in, in terms of my mind, right? It was my brother and I and our family kind of living in a pretty visible sense, right? Uh, you know, by showing the way he was fighting and kind of creating that example. But because of that, um, you know, I, I think our serving as a beacon of hope might be the thing I'm, I'm the proudest of, of when a brother, mother, son, father, you name it, uh, is either diagnosed or their loved ones diagnosed, knowing that they can call me and, and stay strong and 
talk through, you know, from day one, what, what to do, where to head. It's something that I didn't get and my brother didn't get. And, you know, that's why we ultimately started Staff Strong because we saw an area that needed to be changed ultimately. Yeah. And I would think like, obviously um, funding research and like helping people from that standpoint, but that's going to take time. But right. in the here and now, like helping someone feel better in that moment, it can go a really long way. Having that support system of someone who's been through it and that it's not someone you can say, I don't know what you don't know what I'm going through because like yeah. you I do, one yeah. of the, the people that know exactly what yeah. they're, they're going through. I think that's the most powerful thing. And, and oftentimes, you know, people always, I'll say on the outside of GBM, will, you know, struggle of what to do or how to help. And I think no matter what you do or say, just being present or being there is oftentimes enough, but I'm able to provide, I mean, I've seen every single day and angle, unfortunately of this disease and, and you know, it's real. And we chose, and my brother chose not to hide from it because, you know, not that I don't believe everything you know, ultimately happens for a reason, but the fact is he always said, I can only control what I can control. And what we can control is helping other people. What we can control is trying to flip the script and change the narrative on this disease. And, and that's what we do. And he, he did it while fighting this disease, right? Like yeah. what's, what's my excuse at that point? Obviously I'm, you know, proud to continue uh, you know, it's, he, we're co-founders. We, we did this together. This wasn't something that we did after he passed. This was something in the middle of treatments and, and efforts that he was going through and multiple brain surgeries. We're going and speaking at a con cancer conference in the Northeast, right? Because that's what he believed in, in being able to change what he could change while he was here. Was that like a part of him thinking of like the legacy he wanted to leave behind or is he just no. one of those like he just wanted to yeah. help people he's built different and, and, and i think i think a lot of people and gbm is a tough space because you have you know limited time uh, on paper and a lot of people probably do want to leave legacy we started this and right like i was writing kind of creating a website therapeutically right just to get I, it was no one saw it it wasn't live i just guess like hey i'm going through a lot <laughs> I, i'm trying to get my thoughts out there in some way and i sat down with them you know in march and was like hey this is what i've been working on for months you know i if you squash this right now like i'll never mention again and well because our mantra was stash strong because he was growing out a mustache it just was like a family thing and i you know saw an area to make it a little bit more. And he wasn't about the legacy part. He was about just living his life, you know, in the GJ way. And we always called the GJ smile. Well, uh, I, liked, again, I liked in the documentary hit like, his excuse where he was like, I'm not going to be going to work. So it doesn't matter what yeah. I do with my facial hair. Exactly. And that's <laughs> it. He's a CPA in New York city, right? He's just growing out a mustache. This whole thing <laughs> started organically. It wasn't like, Hey, let's, think of a catchy name and a, you know, an organization. Like we were, he grew out his mustache. My dad and I followed suit. People took notice. I coined it kind of as like stash strong. It caught on, created a website. And all of a sudden, you know, <laughs> we're here today with where we've kind of grown to. But again, he was, he was that guy who just led by example, man, quiet, quiet and quiet leader, um, but loud in his actions and just kind of went about, the way he was going to live without worrying about what tomorrow had because he had today to worry about. Well, let's take um, a real quick sponsor break. And then when we get back, um, it, we'll definitely delve more into the overall stash strong story a little later, but I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about the beer and how beer came to be involved in this. Uh, so we will be right back. If you haven't heard about our beer dinners, well, now you have. Typically, the last Tuesday of each month, we partner with a local brewery and craft an exclusive five-course dinner. Each course is thoughtfully paired with some of the finest craft beer available. You'll meet the brewery, enjoy memorable pairings and service, and have a damn good time. Like us on Facebook to stay in the know when tickets become available, because they will sell out quick. Idiom Brewing Company proudly offers a delicious variety of beers to satisfy the most discerning taste. Best known for their wide array of IPAs, delicious fruited sours, and robust porters and stouts, 
Idiom prides themselves on continuing to innovate, utilizing new and experimental hops, local ingredients, and unique flavor profiles. Idiom has a simple goal in mind, to bring people from all walks of life together to enjoy themselves and each other. Idiom Brewing Company is located in downtown Frederick, just south of, south of the intersection of East Street and East Patrick Street, with ample seating and directly on Carroll Creek. All right, so the reason that I'm sure your friend reached out to me is because of the beer. Um, and how did beer uh, become part of this? Yeah, and, and it, it, it's funny. I'm sure people are like, well, where's the connection here? Um, you know, my, my brother and I, obviously, you know, he was diagnosed at 27. I was 24 at the time, uh, you know, three years ago. And we loved to drink beer and we loved craft beer. And he was a big brown ale guy and, you know, loved his Guinness and his Maduro Brown was his number one. Um, but we kind of saw it as we started Staff Strong, one of our good friends uh, works at Oscar Blues. And, you know, I think it was at least a year or two probably after uh, resiliency, which I'm sure, sure everyone listening remembers that. I remember, I mean, I, my brother's not diagnosed at the time. I'm not starting a charity. We're just kind of at the bar in, in Colorado. And I thought how cool to see thousands of, of breweries, uh, you know, across the U.S., let alone wherever else, rally around something that was a big issue at the time, right, and, and c try to rebuild uh, what was going on and I thought so cool right leaves my head never think of it again and as we kind of start things in our first year I thought hey let's let's do a collab or let's you know push a beer um, you know with Oscar Blues obviously of course maybe you should have started with your local mom and pa some people might think but um, yeah, go big go big right go big <laughs> for sure it's the staff strong way um, <laughs> so we, we kind of linked up with a beer um, that they had you know, just trying to help push it um, and connect to a, a brand and a charity. And it went really well year one. And I think not to surprise people, but I think it surprised people, right? The mustache is kind of right in line with the whole brew world. Um, our story, you know, obviously captivating. And we did it again year two. We went down and brewed uh, directly with them. So that was a uh, passion stash, I think was the name of it that year. Went well, sold out like that, 15 barrels. And they're like, it started to catch some eyes of like, I'm sure on the business side, like this is a great idea, great org, let's continue to do it. And then COVID hits and we had a 35 barrel, four states, uh, tap room, distribution. That, I mean, it was set up to be a solid event. And at that point it was kind of like, okay, unfortunate that COVID and production has shut down, but let's not just wait for a year and do this again. Let's think of how we can build this, right? Because the thought was always back to that resiliency. Like my mind was why not have uh, many more breweries involved? So we launched, you know, at, at the idea at the beginning of this year, 2021, as far as like all of our assets and, and you know, ask and, and connecting and, you know, reach out to breweries. And, you know, in my, my humble mind, I thought 30 would be, you know, a great year one of a, you know, collab, a couple states, get our legs underneath us, uh, figure out how this all works on top of what we've already learned from Oscar Blues, and then continue to scale it. And, you know, we're at over 190 breweries uh, okay. in 37 states at this point that are going to be brewing a smash for stash, you know, single malt, single hop, or else uh, agreed upon beer as a part of, we're calling it Brew Stash Strong. So Brew Stash Strong in support of brain cancer research. And it's been, I mean, I use the word humbling a lot just in, Listen, I'm, I'm in a position where I'm able to make change and help and drive it, but it is humbling to watch people you've never met, breweries that you might not even have a connection to, right? We obviously have a connection, I'd say with Keith, but just rally around your cause and jump in from the OnStar. And I've had 20 minute calls with head brewers and general managers and tap room managers, just like so excited to be on board uh, this collab. And, you know, as you zoom forward that whole story, it's a national beer collab at this point and one of the largest in the country uh, in a year one family run nonprofit. You know, it's pretty, it's humbling. Well, it's even more impressive. Like, cause you said you kicked it off in January. Yeah. <laughs> for, like starting to ask people, that's a lot of, especially cause like uh, some breweries plan out pretty oh, yeah. far in advance. So it's, 
like I imagine you will more than double for next year that we have hundreds of breweries like, Hey, timing wasn't right this year. Would love to be involved next year. Right. And I think what's different about us, right. is like, ultimately I'm emailing all these breweries. I'm calling all these breweries. Like we have friends helping us with contacts. I don't, we don't have associates and, and directors of community involvement, right? Like this is a night job, but it's such a passion for me. And as it started to catch heat, I was like, I kept saying to our family, I was like, this is, this is growing. Like, this is a deal, up, guys. I think. <laughs> <laughs> and I, mean, I had to upgrade my Gmail because Gmail wouldn't allow, we had too many emails coming in and out daily and too many emails and, and connections with people, which again is the greatest problem to have. But I think it just shows what the brewery com- community is about. And, you know, again, a mustache, a beer, right? Simple things, something you're already doing, right? A collab beer or, or, or some kind of new beer, be able to link, you know, it's also a great business opportunity to be a part of something so much bigger than just a single brewery. Mm. Yeah. The, the craft beer community is definitely generous and I mean, yeah. we see that time and time again with these, um, bigger purpose type beer, uh, things that have been taking place over the last couple of years. So Keith, yeah, I, why did you haven't said anything? You have any questions? Yeah, I've been enjoying the conversation. Yeah. I've been enjoying the conversation. Um, yeah, I, I, yeah, there's so much to speak on. Um, I mean, first I, what really drew us to the staff strong was like Colin's tenacity. And it seems that you're carrying it on from your brother, DJ. Um, you know, you know, as far as you know, Chris, like Nick and I, we started our company five years ago, just the two of us bootstrap campaign, like cash in our pockets. We had no investors and like we built it literally from the ground up. We custom built our own brew house, which was very janky, but we made it happen. The and, beer uh, was we, really bad too. <laughs> oh yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. You gotta, you gotta put that in every time, but um, <laughs> it needs to be set. Yeah, obviously. Yeah. Well, you know, we never had any professional brewing background. We were just home brewers with, uh, with, <laughs> where do we stand now though? Is our, is our beer, would you say our beer is solid? No, it's really, really good. And oh, it's, it's more on. than solid now. You're, you're, you try. you're, no, I, well, I mean, I, I wouldn't go there if I, and there's a lot of options within five miles of my house. I wouldn't be going old mother out of charity. This is true. <laughs> yeah, the craft beer scene in Frederick is crazy. Um, but anyway, so you know this this sort of thing just it it just aligns with like how we do business and how we just work hard. We put feet on the ground and we just get it done. Um, and we also do have the family ties. So for those of you listening, um, Colin is, was friends uh, with my wife, and uh, that was a small world connection that we just made about a month ago. Um, Courtney's mom was actually asking, so have you, have you, uh, gotten any emails about a, a staff strong fundraiser? And I'm like, yeah, I, I, I have, um, Three. And at that time, <laughs> yeah, and at that time, at that time we were, we literally completely revamped our production schedule. So we had some holes to fill and we had some tank availability. Uh, like Chris said, you know, we try to be three to four months ahead of our production schedule. So when you get, you know, I mean, we get, we get emails, um, you know, on a weekly basis about, you know, like, can you help us out? We're trying to do this. And we always, I mean, Nick and I, we're softies. Um, and we really, we really love using our community to help something that, that we're passionate about helping. Um, I mean, the beer community is passionate because our patrons are compassionate. Um, our patrons, have kept us alive during COVID. Um, you know, government assistance was was okay, um, but honestly, anybody that that doesn't have a community to, to surround them, the government assistance at that at that point in time, it's just a band aid for the inevitable. You you know it was going to happen. Um, our community kept us in business during the pandemic, and um, you know when we were given this opportunity to jump on with you guys and uh, brew this beer. Um, not only did we have sort of a recipe already in mind of something that we wanted to do smash wise, and then you guys came along and we made the family ties 
Um, and we've had some patrons uh, diagnosed with cancer. Um, and then uh, it's some an old mother family member um, was just diagnosed with brain cancer. So, you know, it's just like all the right, you know, everything aligned. And um, we're, we're very happy to be part of this. Because um, like I said, there, there are things that come through our inbox um, that we unfortunately just don't have the schedule to do. And uh, this lined up perfectly. So we're super stoked to be a part of it this year. And uh, we're going to throw a bash and we're going to make it happen. And um, we'll be here. So I think that's the coolest thing you just said of like, and that people, obviously everyone kn knows about it. We've lived it for what, 13 months at this point. We launched what's now a national beer collaboration in January when the world had literally no clue if we were coming back anytime right. soon. Right? right. Every brewery could have said no. <laughs> right? Every brewery could have yeah. said no. And I'm like, you know what? You're right. I'm crazy. I shouldn't be doing it this year. But even with that, even with their tap room shut down and, and production changed and only core beers, like these people were finding a way to at least be involved with it, right? We're unique where I, we don't set like a, you know, you must donate this much and you must make this beer. I don't think that's a collaboration, right? That doesn't sound anything collaborative. This was, Let's work together. I'll work with you on on proceeds, on batch size, on on you know beer type, right? I don't want to create competition where it's only one hop and everyone's running to the same place, and now we're driving up you know value. I'm a CPA. I, I get the business side of this, and I, I think just watching them jump on amidst the most difficult time that any brewery could possibly walk through is just the most amazing thing. And what's the future going to hold when we're fully back, right? And we're past, yeah. you know, vaccinated a year from now, and this goes on year two. I mean, this thing can be pretty major with just minimal involvement by so many breweries. Yeah, absolutely. And that and that was even a thing too, because I had saw you um, had posted asking for suggestions or connections to other breweries, and I was trying to rack my head in like a lot of like places I knew would probably be interested. That production schedule was really because it. I mean, it yeah. was only in the last month that I that I saw that, and I was like, I, "There's," but so I think next year you could definitely like you blew it out of the water this year. Like yeah. next year, you're on you're on you're on for another uh, a big ride. I think. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Which is a great problem to have because it's it's ultimately you know I think another unique piece about us. Like I said, we I don't. I don't make money off this, right? I don't I don't pay any employees. I don't have to keep lights on in any buildings. What we do goes towards research and, and that's the thing I'm most proud of. And as you keep growing more and more breweries, I mean, we, we could off of this alone could be funding multiple clinical trials a year. I mean, what's better than that at that point? So yeah. in, in Maryland, where a lot of my focus is, it's Old Mother and uh, Mob Town will be uh, – brewing this beer um you bob town has an awesome story for why they have an octopus on all their stuff you should talk to them about that ask them ask them the meaning of the space octopus oh, well. next time if you talk to them again um how did you choose the breweries you're con you contacted or did you just throw a wide net and like there's a brewery contact contact <laughs> yeah no it started it started out um you know we obviously we have followers across the country. Everyone's impacted by the disease, and you know my staff strong DMs and Facebook messages and emails, just like, "Hey, try this brewery," and, and you know, it kind of started out like that way. And you know, in the first week, I probably contacted 200, 300 uh, based on that alone. And then you know, as we got responses, oh, this area has one in. You know, again, a co collaboration. Let's see what else is in the area. We got to the point where we had so many you know <laughs> responses coming in and suggestions around breweries as people like realized oh this is a real thing right they're not just trying to brew a beer at three places um we kind of went i mean i'm a i'm a you know 100 miles an hour ahead kind of guy as i'm sure you could tell and we just started grinding of of reaching out to breweries and finding i mean all on my computer sending emails we have one email account and it, <laughs> it's on my <laughs> phone and on my email on my computer not and technology we, man yeah. And we, I mean, cold calls, emails, you name it. Uh, because ultimately I, I'm very confident that if you at least hear our story or if you spend four minutes watching part one of the documentary, you can still say no, but 
it's gonna be a lot harder to because you just generally want to help. And that's the thing that's just different about our charity in that aspect. So I knew that if I could at least get in front of the right person, give me two minutes of your time, um, we'll find a way both from a philanthropic angle, but also from a business angle to, to make this happen together. Keith, what are you going to brew? Uh, so obviously the idea is a smash beer. So we are doing an English malt and Vic secret pale ale. And it's going to be, oh, we, we have high hopes for it. I think it's going to be awesome. It's a solid hop. Yeah, definitely. I was, we were, we were gonna, as you know, Chris, we really don't have like a year round pale ale that we have in our portfolio. Pale ales don't really sell as well as IPAs or hazies or fruited sours or any of these other crazy beers uh, these days. Um, but I still want one because at the end of the day, that's this, that's a solid go-to beer that you can drink day in, day out. You don't gotta, you don't gotta think about it. That it's a conversation beer. So we want one and, um, we want it to be affordable and this is the start of, of that, of that design. So I think, uh, our first, this first recipe is going to be awesome and we'll see where it goes from there, but. And Colin, when you when you contacted Old Mother, you had no idea about the connection that was shared, right? I I didn't. I knew so like my neighbor. We're from a small upstate New York town. Like yeah. our neighbor mentioned something about a. I don't even know if she fully knew the connection, but uh, it was obviously on one of our lists to start. And, and as you as you said. Um, have you gotten emails from them? Yeah. And I literally probably sent one every, I, I mean, two weeks I had alarms going off. I have a tracker that's now 8,000, you know, deep of, of notes and calls and when it went out and when to follow up because someone of our followers will at least be in someone's ear where they're at least remember us and at, at the very least be captivated enough to visit the website, check us out for a quick second. And, and at the end of the day, that's a win for me because our mission and what we're trying to do gets, it gets explained. But uh, yeah. I learned even more so when I reached out to you and you had mentioned one of your favorite breweries. And I was like, that's bizarre. It's one of the few <laughs> people. Like, I mean, we literally went to the same high school as his wife uh, in yeah. 300 person <laughs> graduating class. So New York, New York, and especially like the Vessel Binghamton theory. Well, once you get upstate, it's, you know, three hours and you're, you're everywhere. Yeah. I can't like, one of five people that I meet in Maryland is from New York. Wild. There's, I don't really know what the, I don't, it's just weird, you know? And the rest are from Pittsburgh. Yeah, yeah. New York <laughs> and PA are like, I mean, obviously they're, they're close states, but interesting. But so like, and that's crazy. For, that... Yeah. And then for like, to be in Vestal, like, you know, people are like, oh, where, where's your wife from in upstate? And I say, oh, a small town called Vestal. Most of them have never heard of Vestal. And then Colin, like, yeah. I'm, I'm from Vestal. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, geez, that's crazy. That's pretty cool. Like you said, yeah. tiny, tiny world. <laughs> yeah, it is. It it's about, I mean, I've learned that throughout this collab and campaign, talking to people, both someone knows someone from a similar area or um, a lot of personally impacted in the brain cancer space. Um, where, you know, I have, I have some, uh, probably 30 breweries with a head brewer GM or equivalent who has personally gone through this with a loved one. And that's when you like get, you know, tingly. Right. And you're like, oh man, we're, we're not only connecting with people who have gone through this, they get it. And, and we're giving in a way an avenue for them to be advocates, right. To do, to do something that might've, they never have done before or, or, or in in their loved one's honor and that's when it starts to get the combination of all that makes this just a a, a fascinatingly uh, beautiful world really is um is the goal that they're all released at the same time or just sometime in april yeah so uh, it's actually may um so right, right. basically it's, everyone's yeah yeah My, so i may have no is, concept of time anymore no, yeah. like, time oh, God. Okay. I hope it's May. <laughs> you know, it's, it's May. I, 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 I got it mixed up from like it was supposed to, they're brewed in April and then yeah. released in May. Yeah, because it brews that strong, so you think I got you. But um, May is National Brain Tumor Awareness Month, 
So that's kind of where the inspo came with timing. Um, it, I, you know, I always, when I'm talking to others, I compare it to breast cancer awareness month, right? In October, you see pink everywhere. You know, it is in some TV sports, you, you're going to know it's breast cancer awareness month. You don't know it's brain tumor awareness month. And, and that's why it's another perfect avenue for us to do it. So kickoff is that April 30th, May 1st, which is a Friday, Saturday combo across the country. Um, and, and, you know, uh, most of them are having on, on tap until it kicks and hopefully everyone's brewing delicious beers that it flies off the shelves and, uh, they're happy with how it's gone, but may will be the availability, uh, to, you know, enjoy these beers at your respective brewery and state. Do you know what day yours will be out, Keith? Do you, are do you able? Uh, it's going in the tank, um, within the next two or three weeks. I can't remember which turn it's going in, but it'll be ready like mid May. Probably okay. week after in Mayo. Yeah, and we have a lot of breweries doing that as well, right? I, I think yep. I, I want to make sure a barrier wasn't because it wasn't ready May one, especially yeah. with our timing, like you mentioned. So yeah, uh, it could be in October, right? I mean, it's it's still doing <laughs> the good work. Yeah, for sure. You need to make the the mustache logo as ubiquitous as the the pink ribbon. Yeah, yeah, we have we have we're in the works with a. Uh, so Bruce Dash Strong is the campaign. And obviously, as I said, we launched in January. So the amount of assets I had to build and writing I had to do was <laughs> enough. But we're working with a graphic designer on a pretty cool uh, Bruce Dash Strong with our logo. I won't give away too much, but um, we're hoping to have it to at least breweries, you know, in time to just see it. But next year, more so, you know, shirts for brewers in, uh, on site and, and bartenders and pint glasses. But uh it's a it's a hot mustache combo. It's gonna be pretty nice, pretty sleek. <laughs> All right, well, let's take a um, one more real quick uh, sponsor break, and I think we could go circle back and get a little more into um, just the story of Stash Strong in general and um, your brother's story a little bit more because there were some things in the documentary that I wanted to ask about. Uh, so we will be right back. There are many reasons why I've chosen District East for where I purchase beer. I love the flexibility of being able to make a custom six-pack or take home a crowler from one of the eight beers on tap. Their friendly and knowledgeable staff do an amazing job at keeping a diverse selection on hand. You can even purchase artwork from the monthly featured artist. District East is located on Northeast Street in Frederick in the same shopping center as Family Mill and Rockwell Brewery. You can find today's beer lists on the District East Facebook page or at www.districteast.beer To all you craft breweries, wineries, and distilleries out there, listen up. Atlantic Custom Solutions is the real deal in providing you branded growlers, ceramics, glassware, and accessories like koozies, coasters, and keychains. Their high-definition digital printing, organic ink, and low-fire process ensures your brand is printed in ultra-high definition, giving you a one-up on the competition. We've used Atlantic Custom Solutions for uncapped branded glassware and couldn't be happier with it. Check them out. Visit www.brandmybeverage.com or give them a call at 434-286-4500 to learn more about how they can help you brand your business. Uncapped is brought to you with support from McClintock Distilling, Maryland's first and only organic certified distillery. They are well known for their award-winning gin and are rapidly growing a name for themselves for their matchstick bourbon and bootjack rye whiskey that have both won double gold at international spirits competitions. You can visit them in historic downtown Frederick along Carroll Creek for tours and tastings. Go to mcclintockdistilling.com for more information. So one of the things I was curious about was the cap that he wore. The... It, was that something new at that time, or was that like a develop, like a treatment that had been already proven? Or um, and I yeah. can't remember what the name of it was. So Optune. can you Optune. Optune. Yeah. So yeah. can you can you tell people about that because that that I found that to be fascinating. Yeah, it, it is, and and one of the interesting things about GBM specifically is is there's been no standard of care they call it um, drug or treatment approved in over a decade. Right. So currently, uh, you know, high end speaking, as my brother's story, for example, right, had a seizure out of the blue, had surgery, moved on to um, radiation of the brain and chemotherapy. Right. And then once you get past that point, there's no standard of care from an FDA approved drug. 
So Optune is a device. Um, and if you look online, stashstrong.org or documentary, you'll see a picture somewhere of my brother wearing it. But um, basically has four sets of electrodes that are, they call it tumor treating fields that are, you know, again, in layman's terms, sending pulses throughout the brain to confuse and break up um, these aggressive and fast growing glioma cells. Um, so with that, it's, I will call it, um, it is, you know, as far as stats and, and numbers are concerned, it is being proven so far as a life extender. It is not a cure, obviously, um, as you know, my brother and several people have worn it and have unfortunately passed, but, um, that was an intriguing and uh, fascinating is a perfect world word device for us because it just, it was, you, you have no control of this, this, this disease, like none at all, right? You can't, there's no, if you go full tilt um, on every treatment, there's still a good chance that it's going to come back and, and be more aggressive. And you're never really fully in remission with this disease. And, you know, applying that, I'd shave my brother's head every, you know, two to three days. And, and cause we both live in New York city at the time and, you know, would apply it. And he was in control, right. And in our mindset, what you could see, a lot of people are afraid to wear it cause he loses his hair, obviously. Right. He's shaving his head every day. And, you know, it's this device with wires and a backpack, you know, as far as optics are concerned, it, it, it's not something I would sign up to wear it tomorrow. Right. And he just, he just did it. And he, we'd be at a, a brewery, at a bar, at a restaurant, someone's staring, you know, we got used to it, but he, he took it as an opportunity to educate, right? Cause it's not every day you see someone with a device of, you know, electrodes on their scalp with wires into a backpack and, you know, with our little staff strong logo, uh, <laughs> smartly placed on the back, but he, he took it as an opportunity to educate people because he didn't know what it was before it happened. And we're on the subway in New York city. I mean, he went back to work for the first year i mean he was symptom free people would look at him like what in the hell is going on there <laughs> and he just he owned it right and it was something that he just wore and when he wore it which was 95 percent of the time because when it was on it was working in our mind and, and it's something that i think both scientifically and medically was working um but also for us just from a, a family and a mindset for him like when he knew if he put that on for that day he was in control because hmm. it, it's one of those things that are, it doesn't look like anything. So I met like, if you're seeing it for the first time, you probably are staring. Cause oh, it, no like, it looks like I had to get over that. that was a tough thing for me. Yeah. <laughs> Cause People it's always. not like you have no reference of like, Oh, that must be this no. thing. It's just, it, it's a very unique looking device in the space and like treatment. It, I'll call it like your third, right. There's two main options of uh, chemotherapy, FDA proven and the radiation uh, in terms of what you definitely um, have a, you know, scientifically better chance of, of prolonging your life. But this is that third option that a lot of people do choose. Um, and we were actually ambassadors for the company and, you know, at the time would travel and just speak to people to help them. I mean, he was golfing with that thing. He's on a boat with, with this thing. I mean, again, if you look at it, like how the hell are you walking from, you know, your fridge to the couch and he's out there literally living more life than most people do normal yeah it's amazing so you you have referred to it as aggressive a few times is that what leads to it being so uh deadly is that even if like with the surgery like you can't get everything so like what That's exactly what tiny can't. little bit is left just starts multiplying yeah. again and again it's different for every person right but yeah the majority beyond majority um what happens is they call like tentacles. Um, so you see, I mean, my brother had a golf sized tumor, right? Um, a full golf ball in his brain that they removed and everything they saw, they removed. It was actually one of the better surgeries. There's people who have it wrapped around a very difficult part of their brain and we're talking a whole nother world, right? Um, but what happens is there's pieces and pieces like little tentacles that you just don't see and you can't see. It's not a technology thing. It's just, it's the nature of this beast. And because of that, you're kind of, we call it scanxiety. You're going in for MRIs on you know a monthly basis after surgery. And he's back at EY, he's a high flying manager in New York City. He's running three miles faster than most could do after training. And, and you think everything's fine, but you're always holding your breath because 
you know, you don't think at the time it's going to come back. You, you train yourself to believe that it's not going to, but it's there. And you, I said, you're never in remission. You always, you always have glioblastoma. Unfortunately, there are long-term survivors. There are very few and they're wonderful, lucky individuals um, with obviously their own journey as well, but it's always there, which is tough because other cancers, in theory, once you hit five-year remission, that's that's what I compare it to. You hit five-year remission in another cancer. You're considered pure. You're, you're, you're kind of like safe in a way. Um, again, there's plenty that doesn't work for it, but you hit five years in GBM. Not only are you one of the only 5% that's done that, it's not, it's not gone. And it's still always in the back of your mind that that thing can come back. And my brother's example came back on the other side of his brain, you know, additional brain surgery. I mean, he was, he had to learn how to use a fork and knife. Right. And then six months later, he's back at work again. And, and it's just, I mean, the nature of this, who he was and what he was about, but that's what it does. And then the third recurrence just took over his brain. And, you know, that was, it, it did what it, it does, unfortunately, but that's the problem. It's so aggressive and, and oftentimes not just aggressive, but quickly. <laughs> so it, it's, mm -hmm pervasive and it grow it it replicates really really fast yeah and that's why that's where i think the rare you word gets tossed around more accurately because it's not common for a, a cancer just to do that right it's not like yeah. this is something that's all over your body it's in a centralized spot 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 you know most of the time right he had a seizure out of the blue they found a tumor you know it was it was a you could see a huge circle on his on his side of his brain of his mri um and it just, it comes back and it just, it's here. And next thing you know, it's just spreading and growing. There's a point where you just can't, you can't do anything else um, until it fully takes over. Is that the common way of how it's found? Like, yes. Like uh, headaches or yes. Seizures? Headaches, seizure, forgetting something, maybe like all, I mean, you think of your brain ultimately is your, you know, uh, hard drive, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, operates everything. And a lot of people will, ha it's not something that you can, scan regularly for that's just not a preventative yeah. measure unfortunately i mean he had that thing in there they said for probably over a year right we're going out we're celebrating birthdays we're having fun we're doing things all the while it's it's growing until it hits kind of something that causes a reaction uh oftentimes you just don't know about it yeah because it's not like you can just go in and get an annual mri yeah. done right <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> um so does it, is it destroying cancer cells or is it just because it's growing and then pushing on? Uh, wait, um, in what sense? Uh, like, so like when your brother first had it, that caused a seizure, is it because it like, it's a mass that's growing and pushing, it's a mass that's or growing. It, yeah. So okay. it eventually hit a spot of his brain that triggered a seizure. Um, you know, as your brain telling you like something's not right. And, I mean, they, and that's the thing They, didn't, I thought he was like dehydrated or something, right? I, it was Labor Day weekend. I was supposed to meet up with him at night, at night and I was at the beach two hours away and, and had to Uber home. And even at that time, I, truthfully, I thought Labor Day weekend, you know, maybe he's a little lightheaded, maybe a little hungover, had a seizure. And then you, all of a sudden you're hearing out in the hallways, the word mass and tumor, right? And they're whispering. It's like, well, what's going on here, right? You know, I don't know those words at 20 what, four years old at the time. And yeah. he certainly doesn't at 27. That's not a term we're ready for or, or a life we're ready for. And that's the problem. It just happens like that. And it, it you know, we're, I think we're lucky in a, in a sense was probably people listening. Like, How the hell are you lucky? But you know, he, I had, I had a full 25 months with my brother after diagnosis where a majority of that 13 of the first months were literally symptom free. People don't get a, a month or two at times, right? And, and again, is it lucky that my 27 year old brother was diagnosed? Absolutely not. But given the stack we were kind of dealt, we were on a better side. He doubled life expectancy of a disease that we've touched on is aggressive, fast growing, and can create a seizure on a you know Saturday morning out of the blue. Yeah, and I, I remember from the documentary when they asked him if he knew where he was and <laughs> why he was there, his guess was that he had drank too much. Yes. That, that, <laughs> that's my brother in the greatest sense you could ever imagine. Right? He just making jokes of the fact that he had a seizure and they found a golf ball in his brain. He thought <laughs> his buddy asked him, do you know why you're here? And he said, I assume we drank too much at brunch. It's like <laughs> just his ability to downplay it. I think, I think it probably helped him, but I think it helps so many other people 
because mm. they were able just like to hang out with Jeeves like normal. It, you didn't have to go in and the first word was like cancer, how you're feeling because you saw him and he dictated that room and he was doing well and he was doing great. And, and I think like that documentary, that line always cracks me up and I love to watch it because it just is the perfect five second example of who he was. <laughs> mm. So did, um, did you guys ever get into home brewing or anything like that? Or it was, is it always just enjoying the consumption? Yeah. Enjoy the consumption. Um, the learn mud, a lot. I mean, that's I mean, definitely the best part of it. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I, I did, we did learn a lot. Like when we brewed at Oscar blues, like I never in a million years before that would have thought of how much work goes into a 15 barrel beer. Right. Like, yeah. I mean, he put us to work for 10 hours. It was awesome. And it was like drinking the fruit of your labor. I get it. Right. It's so awesome. My focus is obviously on, on the side that I'm on. Um, I've, I've brewed like a small home batch once or twice with a friend. I think it's fascinating, but you know, doing it at a, at a bigger level or even in this sense, right. Where I'm going to get to go meet teams, you know, just like this, talk about my brother, talk about our story uh, in different States and breweries and, and make sure, make sure they really know, the volume of the impact they're having um, and getting to enjoy, you know, what they've made is, is I'm going to be on the consumption side. More. <laughs> <laughs> the, when, um, when you reached out to Oscar blues, did you go through your friend or did you just, you we, yeah, we went through, yeah, okay. he was, he was like a district tapper manager of a few uh, different States. So okay. had obviously a Paul's worked there for years and was trusted enough with this project internally, which again is pr- if they don't say yes, this doesn't happen. Right. Yeah. And, and three years ago, and that's why I'm always so thankful every time I'm there. No, they didn't have, I mean, we, we raised $20,000 at the time, right. We were brand new. We were just a family story and, you know, trying to make something happen and they jumped on with it and, you know, credit to Lou at Oscar blues who just drove this home over the last two years with them internally. I'm sure he had to go through many steps and, and things to make something happen with a, know not proven organization but you know by the end of this campaign and a few different deals that are happening we're going to be a one million dollar organization for brain cancer research right that's a number that turns heads and and things that you know i can look at along the way of partnerships and help that's happened this with ob is one of the biggest things that's going to help us have a national collab year in year out are are, they're making it again this year right yeah Mm yeah they're doing 35 barrels i think um okay are they, is it down in, at the North Carolina brewery? Yeah, so they're, they're going to have it at, uh, in Austin, Brevard, uh, Longmont, and, and Boulder. Um, okay, so they're doing at, it all at the, like the, at the pubs. Yep, yep, and they're, they're canning and, you know, whether there's – the cool thing is this just grows, right? As you hear about it locally, a restaurant can just get – every year, hey, we're in for two kegs, right, or we're in for 10 yeah. cases, whatever the numbers are. And all of a sudden, I mean, you could create a spider web of – seeing staff strong at your local areas that can you need to just ask them why they aren't doing a full production run of it yeah well that's (laughs) the thing as as we keep (laughs) that might be coming coming. yeah we've got to know the head one of the head brewers there in colorado pretty well awesome guy juice to pro uh and he's i mean he was so awesome two years ago before the obviously pandemic that year of brewing and just teaching us about beer and he he wanted just to make the most kick-ass beer possible Cause he, he met my brother, right? He's, he's the only brewer who's ever going to meet my brother. And he, he saw just like what he was about and what our story is about. And I think it kind of went into their beer and how they tackled it, uh, creatively, creative, creatively, um, to kind of make that happen to embody my brother in our org. Hmm. So he was there for the first brewing. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Cause that was our first brew actual brew year was 19. Um, so we brewed in like April. Um, so we went down and we had like a kickoff. Our whole family went down to the, uh, um, Colorado location. And, you know, we had like a kickoff event and my brother was obviously there wearing his opt to and having a beer. Obviously he was like a limited, could only have, you know, one, which was, um, what, you know, what he had to go through, unfortunately, but, uh, he was there and met their whole crew. So I think that also solidified things of really, I mean, as I said, if you give me five minutes, if you gave him one minute, he didn't have to say anything. And, and <laughs> you were going to feel that story and what was going on and, and look at him like, I, I stubbed my toe yesterday. I'm still complaining. And here he is just living a life of, you know, 
without a worry in the world. Yeah, I mean, like just watching the documentary, you can feel the energy that he put off. So yeah. I imagine like being in his presence, hearing a story, like that would be really hard for anyone to tell him no. Yeah, exactly. Are um are you gonna be able to participate in any of the brewings this year? Are, are there any breweries you're gonna go to? Yeah, we're we're doing a few, and, and you know it, it's one of those things where I can't really leave the state yet. I'm getting vaccinated uh, later in tax season too. Soon, yeah, yeah. There's plenty. Yeah, of- you know, it's not a good time for you. <laughs> oh yeah, so I'm actually interestingly, I'm I'm on like a one year rotation with our corporate responsibility team, which is obviously okay. a picture you can tell after this conversation where we live after everything I've gone through. Um, but yeah, I've I was manager in tax at, at Price Waterhouse Cooper, so that's uh. <laughs> that takes up a lot of my time as well. Um, but yeah, we're, we're going to be going to a lot of breweries on weekends in the road. Um, just to thank the teams, right. Uh, you know, raise a pine with the team that decided to, to jump in on this collab. And, and my biggest thing is the money raised is going to be important and we're going to raise pretty sizable funds at this point with nearly 200 breweries, but to be able to just, have them learn our story and, and, and know my brother and, and put more than just, Hey, we're doing this beer this month again for X, Y, Z org. We're done. Wash off our hands. Like, no, no, no. I, I want, I want to make sure that when, when you brew this beer and the month's over, you remember Sashong and you have a purpose of, of knowing our story. And as people talk about it, you don't have to talk about it in detail, but you can at least just know what we're about, what we raise, what we're focused on. Um, and I, Think that's the relationship we're looking for and we have anyways with breweries because they're unique individuals and they don't they're not there to, to have your ten dollars for two pints they're they're here to learn about you and learn about the community and be you know active in their community and ultimately you know one trial we launched alone is in 35 states for you know glioblastoma research that alone is a local project in every single state of brewery alone from a research standpoint um that we're kind of proud of to to work with them are you are you gonna make it down here in Maryland? To probably not. Or to probably. We're close. We're, we're well, quick- yeah, definitely. I mean, I would love to. Now that we're getting bigger, like in, with this, I would love to have, especially with some of our. I mean, uh, going to be one of our bigger, you know, involvements and in, and in, in partnerships, and obviously with a bit of a personal connection. I think that obviously always makes it just easier um, to market and sell. But you know, again. We started this in January. I thought we were gonna have thirty breweries. Uh, <laughs> you should see my you should see my schedule after six thirty p.m. every day and before like eight a.m. when I hit work hours of people I talk to and things we do. But um, would love to you know get to that point where we can pop in, even if it's like for an hour or two a brew. We start to get more breweries in one area. We can kind of make that circle and, and get to know everyone even better because that's what I'm about. I think the relationships of, of this are the most important thing of what we're able to do as opposed mm-hmm. to just slap another logo on a beer for sure i i tell you i would probably have made a better fly on the wall than a co-host chris yeah i've learned that really quick i i no i mean i i normally talk a lot but i i am i'm blown away and humbled just by the education and just the story and i mean man I had my listening ears on today, so I apologize. I mean, don't judge me. I'm not going to stop doing that. <laughs> <laughs> but see, I think that, uh, I think that's the greatest example, like of 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 what we do, right? And then after this podcast, when I get, get to your location eventually, like we're past all that, and and you can get to know each other and, and those types of things. Yeah. But yeah. learning of the story, again, it, I know it's my life. I know it has gone through, and I could talk to you for ten hours, right? I don't want to in terms of that much detail, but being able just to briefly talk about our story and mission, it's captivating. And there, there's no, yeah. there's no ifs, ands, or buts about that. And that's the most powerful thing about Stat Strong of, you know, being able to continue my brother's fight and his story. And you know, listen, there's two people yeah. right here that have never met my brother and will unfortunately never meet him, but I guarantee you his impact will have some type uh, of impact on you just from these conversations. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that that's done deal. That's already fact uh, case, you know, case closed on that. Um, yeah, we're, we're definitely looking forward to being a part of this. Um, you know, it, it, it takes a village. I mean, admittedly, when you think about a fundraiser or doing something, you do sometimes just think about 
you know, the branding or just putting something on a can and calling it a day and just checking it off the list. Right. Yeah. Um, but, you know, going through the time that we're going through right now and, and sort of seeing the light at the end of the tunnel, um, you know, like having the, having our customer base and having our, our old mother family come in and support us. I mean, we all chip, we chipped away at it. You know, we chipped away at it. We paid bills and, and we're here. Um, it wasn't just a one lump sum kind of deal. And when we think about partnerships and things, um, we want to make an impact, right? And it's hard to it's hard to think about. Basically, we don't want to fail, right? So we sign on for this thing, and we're like, "There's no like I'm going to feel terrible if we if we bring 200 bucks to the pot, right?" But the fact of the matter is, is that if a thousand breweries bring 200 dollars to the pot, that's that's not chump change. That is where the funding happens for that sort of research. So, you know, like call it a revelation or call it just, um, you know, being able to realize that one person doesn't necessarily need to be the full financial answer for whatever's happening. I mean, like you said, we're all a community. We're all here. If everybody's got five bucks, we're going to catch a ride somewhere. So exactly. it's, um, it's amazing. And, uh, you know, we're, we're every brewery that's still standing is living proof that, that, you know, small bits and pieces here and there, put everything together. And, uh, that, that's what this is, man. So for you to launch this, uh, nationwide fundraiser and have, have the traction that you do is, um, that's no small feat. And it's certainly not by chance. It's, it's certainly by the story that you're telling and, um, the legacy that you're, that you're living on with your brother's memory. And um, we're happy to be a part of it. Is, um, is brew stash strong, the number one way that stash strong um, raises funds or do you, do you have other? I say no, because we've never, we've never done it. Right. Um, but it will become <laughs> one of our, it will become one of our staples. Um, we have a national 5k every September. Um, this will be the fourth this upcoming September. Again, we learned we could go virtual last year and, you know, clusters of, of friends and family can run. We have different color race shirts every year. We had 1,114 people last year run it and participate and register. Um, that's a number that's going to continue to grow as we kind of every year, right? We, we went from 200 to 400 to 1,200. That's kind of a, the pattern we're seeing as we reach more and more areas and, and communities so that's a big one for us and then honestly just we have two big events in new york city and chicago that have been fully put on hold which is kind of part of why i had to rethink strategy and and scale this, this uh, beer campaign um but otherwise i mean we have people even just from these conversations i mean i've had people just five dollars and and i've had people send thousands of dollars right and, and each one are just as important to me because you know, that dollar to you is obviously important in your day to day life. And to take five dollars oftentimes from someone is, is more impactful than the, the one who has a wide open wallet. Um, mm -hmm. But we're just kind of able to continually grow our strategy and, and mold. But this is going to be I mean, there's no I'm I'm conservative in terms of when I give estimates around these things. I Clearly, I thought we'd have 30 breweries in year one. <laughs> Um, but this is a $200,000 year one campaign, right? There's breweries that are doing 30, 40 barrels. That yeah, alone yeah. is huge. I, I breweries doing one or two barrels that are doing 10, 20, 30%. And that's huge as well. So you put all that, like, I mean, you couldn't have said it better. You put all that together. You have 200 breweries doing that year one. You're making a big difference. And $200,000 to us is four clinical trials, right? Two robust clinical trials. Mm. That I mean, I get goosebumps when I say that out loud because that doesn't happen on a yeah. what are we Tuesday? That doesn't just occur out of the blue. And to have that impact in year one, like you said, you double that, triple that. I mean, this thing has the opportunity to build some serious research and change in a space that needs it. Yeah, and Chris is going to shave his beard and grow his mustache. I mean, what's better than that? <laughs> I look, I look so stupid without a beard. I'll teach like, you how to do it. I, I'm, I'm, I'm like in the between stage. So I'm like another two weeks. It takes me about a month to go from zero to full. So 
I'll, I'll be on full full on. I just wasn't ready for April one yet. <laughs> maybe, maybe I'll consider it. And I'll I'll be that one person in May that refuses to take their mask off. No, I'm good. I just, no, that's I, cool. <laughs> I, I mean, you know, sir, you don't have to wear that anymore. No, I I'm, 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 I feel I safe with it. <laughs> so Boys, it's my blind. I don't, I don't want to cut you all short, but I do have to jump. All right, go take um, care, so Charlie. You guys, yeah, you you guys can do your thing, but I got I got family business. It was a pleasure to meet you. I'm glad I could put a yeah uh, for sure, in. man. Yeah, well, uh, next time I'm up in town, we'll uh, we'll grab a beer for sure. Love it. All right, Chris, uh, thank you for allowing me to be co-host. I'm sorry that I was terrible, but I was listening. I mean, it's par for the course, buddy. (laughs) All right, guys. Take care. Uh, See ya. I had another question, and then Keith all ruined my train of thought. (laughs) Um, Oh, so do you – how does the money make it from donating to you to funding clinical trials? Yeah, tremendous question. So we we have a medical advisory board that we've been able to put together. Um, I consider myself lucky, again, lucky. In, in my brother's treatment, he had top professionals and, and top neurosurgeon, and one of which uh, is a board member, a uh, general board member of, of our organization. So uh, between telling our story at conferences across the Northeast and, and, and his help and guidance and you know being a leading neurosurgeon in New York City, we've been able to start to accept grant proposals and requests. And I mean, you, if people on this thought, I said a few things about Optune or the brain. I mean, these, you should see this. Uh, it's over my head, 10 levels. Um, but that's good because we have a medical advisory board with leading neurosurgeons, oncologists, radiologists who are reviewing and scoring just like the NIH would do, right? A top, you know, Institute of Health in, in, in the world. Um, is able to grade their uh, proposals for funding, we do the same way. So, you know, it, it, it's a tremendous question because often, so especially you're, if you're getting- You're, you're giving money. it, you're giving it directly. Directly, but, yeah. So we've, we've funded for- probably, I mean, I don't know how that world works, but I'm guessing that's gotta be the most efficient way because there, there's no there's no one that's taking cuts along the way for their overhead, like administrative costs or any, like for them to operate, like you're taking the money in. Yeah, you'd be deciding. fascinated if you looked at some of the biggest orgs and, and again, they have to do it, right? If you're raising yeah. hundred million dollars a year, you need salaries. You, you can't do what I'm doing. I, I yeah. fully understand that. But you know, what we're most proud of is, I mean, we save 10 cents at the post office when we're mailing out a 5K shirt, right? Like every cent, it matters to <laughs> us because it's going towards research. Yeah. Um, so we don't have admin costs that come out. Staff Strong isn't, you know, funding whatever my new computer. Right? We are funding brain cancer research. We support brain cancer research. So because of that, and because of who we've gotten to know and work with, you know, we accept grant proposals directly from these institutions. Right? Northwestern, we've we've funded a, a year's worth of research. Mount Sinai, in New York City, um, launched a clinical trial. We were part of. A bigger gift that did is called GBM Agile, that's in 35, I think now sites, and it's moving international. So we're able to, you know, every grant I work with, if I work with other orgs, I have a clause that we've written in there from a legal standpoint that you know uh, cuts admin costs from that org to use. Because listen, I, I'll find where it needs to go. We have reached that network at this point. We're working on a, a major consortium project funded by Staff Strong alone. That's that's what's different about us because when you give a dollar, it's going towards where it needs to go, right? Yeah, the every every dollar is more effective than a, a Matt, lot those of things that we raise go directly towards research. We don't. Uh, you look at our year end financials. There's no salaries. There's no car expense. There's no trip. When I go and visit all these breweries, it's it's a vacation in my mind, right? I get a, a Friday off and I take Saturday Sunday to see these places. We don't spend a dollar for that. It's just part of my passion and what we're doing to get the most out of every dollar. That's amazing and and very admirable. So I, I think that makes this even like a bigger kind of thing because like every money that's raised from this beer is going to directly towards the mission. And it's powerful to tell people that, right? Because I don't think you hear it every time when you do these types of things. And again, Every org is different and, and 
you know, there's plenty that you have to do. I understand. Um, yeah. but I, I'm not in this for a profit, right? This took the, my favorite thing in my life away from me. I'm trying to make sure that doesn't happen to the next set of brothers. How do you do that? You, you make each dollar louder than the next. What is your favorite kind of beer? Like favorite style? I'm an IPA guy, which I know is probably like everyone's an IPA guy. Um, and I love IPAs. Yeah, I, I love IPAs. <laughs> uh, I'm also a huge Guinness guy. I love that's like my if I go to a bar and I want a you know easy beer, I'm not drinking a Bud Light. I will order a Guinness from a good Irish pub. You know, there's a Guinness brewery in Maryland, right? Yeah, I do know that. So, We've been to Ireland see? a few times. There's there's everything's there's pointed an, towards coming to the Mecca. Yeah. I don't I don't know why you're not visiting us. That's on me at that point. <laughs> and, and it's not that it's not even that far from Mobtown. Mobtown's maybe 10 oh, yeah. minutes. So away. how far this is sounds naive. Is it like five hours from New York City? Six no, no, you can get to Baltimore on the train for like in like three hours. Oh, really? How, yeah, far, yeah. how far are those two from I don't I know where the towns because I see them all on the website. Yeah, Mo- um, Mob Town is in Baltimore. Um, okay. I don't know, like from the train station, how close they are. I mean, Baltimore is not huge, so it can't be that far. Um, Guinness is right outside of of Baltimore. Um, we're forty five minutes to an hour. We we are being Keith and I. We're both in Frederick. Frederick's okay. about a. 45 yeah, we minutes had a few, to an hour. Yeah, we had a few, few breweries we talked to originally in Frederick. I can't remember the names, but I think it's one of those things like he might touch on. Tough year for breweries. Yeah. And as they see more and more doing it, I mean, year or two, if I, once we're able to say nearly 200 breweries, 200,000 raised, four clinical trials, I mean, jump on board, right? I mean, that's a team you want to be involved with at that point. Well, I know from a, a lot of the people I know, it, it it's partially that like some places are struggling right now. Um, but then also it's just like trying to be able to fit it into schedule, schedule, especially breweries that have, um, that are in distribution. They've made commitments to their distributor that they're going to have this. So it's not, I think a lot of people think like, well, you own the brewery, just brew whatever you want. Like, 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 no, I have the next six to 12 months planned out. Like, get me, get me in, you know, June for next year. Yeah. So it, it's def- that's what I'm thinking. Like next year is going to be a big deal for you for as big a deal. This is like next yeah, year. We'll, will be- yeah. Thankfully it'll be year two. I think, I think 200 is a good start for, yeah. for fast drop to get. Yeah. To get Cons- consider us your training wheels. Yeah. <laughs> big tyke. Right. Um, tell everyone where to find um, all the information and to follow you. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. So we're on, uh, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at Stash Strong. That's S T A C H E Strong. Um, so just one one handle across the board. Uh, www.stashstrong.org um, backspace backspace Brew Stash Strong specifically, but super easy uh, to navigate website. Um, and then you know, obviously, we've touched on a documentary a few times. I always urge if, if you just if you want to spend five minutes to say who who are these, if this didn't cover it for you about who we are, uh, watching a documentary really gives a good look into our family at the, at the beginning of my brother's diagnosis and the beginning of Stat Strong. We say, you know, in, in the part three, we, we just raised $50,000 and I just remember how happy we were about that. And again, in two months, we'll be able to say we've raised a million dollars for brain cancer research. Obviously, I've come a long way and grown. And a true million dollars. And a true million dollars, yeah, and that that's net dollars, right? Even even money we've had to spend on shirts and our online store, right? That's our only expense, uh, yeah. which is really an expense covered by the con- consumer ultimately. But you can check us out uh, there, and then you know ultimately on our website you can see alphabetically, uh, state by state and brewery by brewery of the you know nearly two hundred breweries that are participating in, in Brew Staff Strong uh, to you know obviously go and support your local brewery, even if they're not involved, mention it, uh, the success that's happening and, you know, continue to work together with breweries to, to make something special happen. Is there anything else you wanted to cover or tell people about? No, I think, I think that's it. Um, I I obviously super appreciate you kind of funny how it happens, right? A friend reaches out on Instagram and, you know, I'm sure you did your 
due diligence and check this out. But I think this is really the way that we continue to grow in a different fashion of, you know, obviously you have a voice and are connected with different breweries in this specific fashion, but just having these conversations, like this is the first podcast I've done, right? So you have to grade me afterwards, but um, <laughs> just getting on and, and having these conversations, right? This is my mission and my passion to, I mean, even if it's, if, if you just, you get a great sense of what staff strong is I've done my job today and tomorrow will be someone new or hopefully right to continue to grow. But I just urge everyone to follow us on social media, you know, check us out. There's plenty of ways to donate, get involved. You know, I don't need your dollars necessarily. As long as I have your eyes and your voice, I think that we can do some pretty powerful things, uh, both in the beer world and in, in the cancer space. Well, thank you so much for your time this evening and for sharing your story. Um, I think it, I think it will touch a lot of people. Um, and I will echo urging people to go to the breweries that are brewing it this year. And if you're at a brewery that isn't brewing it, ask them why not just to plant, plant the seed. I that the they seed. <laughs> um, so, and thank you everyone for uh, watching and listening. Cheers. Cheers. Thanks for having me.